in chapter 28, they, they, they go through these blessings and curses. And, and really, um, you know, you might, you might say God was almost kind of a downer there. The, the curses are like three times the length of the, of the blessings. But the blessings are all-encompassing. Um, if you remember there, he says, uh, I'm going to bless you when you're in the city and when you're in the country. When you go out and when you come in. When you rise up and when you go to bed. Everything that your hand touches, your family, your produce, your trade, he says you will loan, but you will not borrow. You will be the head and you will not be the tail. I mean, the blessings almost didn't have to be as long because God said, I'm going to bless you everywhere. Everywhere that you could interact with man and interact with the natural universe, I'm going to bless you in every way. To such an extent that it makes me wonder why we would ever be unfaithful to the Lord. I mean, I'm just appalled uh, at my own lack of fidelity to the Lord when I think about how He has blessed me, how, how He's promised to forgive me, and yet some shiny little object, some nothing burden, will draw me away and cause me to, uh, to wander from him. And, and yet, this has always been the case. And, and in Deuteronomy 30, he says, I have set before you life and death. Now, there's not a lot between that. Um, you know, some of you are aware that, that I work in the ER, and, and I deal with this all the time. Uh, life and death, and there is a point where you're alive, and there's a point where you're dead, and there's just, you know, you're either one or the other. He says, I've offered you blessings and cursings. And, and to put this in where we are in the body of Christ and our relationship with Him, we're either, we're either in the faith and we're saved or we're lost. You might think of the passages in Matthew chapter 7 where he, Jesus talks about the narrow way. The narrow way versus the broad way that leads to destruction. There again in chapter 7, he talks about the wise man who builds his house upon the rock. That's the one who listens to the teachings of Christ versus the one who rejects the teachings of Christ. You know, there's just not a point in between there. Have you noticed that? I mean, that's what I'm looking for, right? I'm looking for the point in between where I can kind of say I'm in a relationship with the Lord, but I have a foot in the world. You know, where I can have a little bit of sin and kind of hang out with the world and, and not just have to sacrifice too much. I mean, I'll give up the things that are easy to give up, right? See, this is the constant struggle for the one who wants to follow the Lord. This morning as I was talking to the, the boys when we were driving over, I, I said, I asked them, who is religion for? That's a little bit of a trick question, right? Religion meaning devotion to God, not the, the kind of casual way people use it. Devotion to God, who is that for? Well, it's really for everyone. But it's only going to be for the one who's willing to deny themselves. Because if, if religion consists of me doing what I want to do, then that's no religion at all. You know, oh, I like that passage, and I don't like that one, so we'll skip over that. That's, that's no religion at all. And this morning, as we're in the Old Testament, I want you to turn to 2 Samuel 24. And this will be the, the bulk of our lesson. And I want you to see how these choices of life and death play out in the life of David. There is a parallel passage to 2 Samuel 24, and it's 1 Chronicles 21. And I, I'm not going to make every effort to align the two passages. I will uh, refer, to them, uh, refer to that text from, from time to time to, to supplement what... Uh, is not in 2 Samuel. Notably, 
in verse 1 of 2 Samuel 24, it says, Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against him, saying, Go number Israel and Judah. Now, 1 Chronicles 21 tells us that the, the inciter of, of this event was Satan himself. Now, that shouldn't surprise us at all, because Satan is a servant of the Lord, in that if God wants to use Satan to accomplish his own purposes, he will accomplish it. And he will use good and bad and indifferent. Everything will ultimately serve God's purposes. We know this uh, as we get glimpses into the life of Job. As we're told, Satan seeks to devour us, but even, even in Satan's efforts, he is but merely a servant of the Lord, uh, in spite of what he thinks. And, and we're told here that David will tell Joab to go out and number the people of Israel. Now, I tell you, i got to just be honest with you, when I refresh myself in the Scriptures, I always thought this was bad, you know, you, that you never could do this. But there are some, some occasions. Uh, one of them is in Exodus chapter 30, where a census was taken of the people. And this seems to be solely, though, for the purpose of determining the tax that would be used to support the Levites and the work of the tabernacle. And, and so this was an appropriate thing and, and was only given in that sense. There is a, a, a time in Numbers 26. And if you'd remember, uh, when the 12 spies were sent out, and 10 of them gave a bad report, and only two of them uh, uh, said that, yes, God can, with God's strength, we'll just go in there and, de and defeat these giants, and this, this is the land that's been promised to us. Well, because the people rebelled, those who were above the age of 20 died in the wilderness. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And this census taken in Numbers 26 is of those who were of military age, 20 and older, who had grown up in the wilderness, that they, that they were sustained by the Lord because of His promise. And the, specifically, at the end of Numbers 26, it says, this census does not include anyone from those who died in the wilderness. And so this is a new, a new group of people. I guess the oldest she could have been was 59 at, at that point. With the exception, it says, of Joshua and Caleb. So, so not every census uh, was problematic. But we might, I, I guess, kind of question ourselves, why would David do this? Look, look at 2 Samuel 24. It says in verse 2, So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army, who was with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and number the people, that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of my lord the king still see it. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing? I think this is interesting. I think Joab might have cast a little bit of shade <laughs> on David here, and he said, look, I don't know why you want to go out and, and, and count the people. You can barely see them anyway. You're, you're, you're aging. And he said, David, you don't want to do this. You, God has blessed you. He will continue to bless you. Right? This is a, this is a reference to the, to the blessings enumerated there in the book of Deuteronomy. God, God said he, he took David from, from being a shepherd and made him head over all Israel. I mean, just blessed beyond his wildest imagination. And yet David wants to do this. Notice in verse 4, the king's word prevailed against Joab and the commanders of the army. I want to ask you something. Have you ever known you shouldn't do something, but someone just kept kind of grinding on you and grinding on you about it, and you ultimately gave in? I mean, I kind of pride myself on being pretty stubborn. I call it independent. 
I'm an Atkins, by the way. That's, that's the way we roll. But have I been led into doing something that I didn't initially want to do because someone else was just... Why, yes. Have I caved to pressure? Yes. And, and here the commanders, not just Joab, who we might make note, is not always held up in the best light in Scripture. Remember Joab who killed uh, uh, the two brothers in a time of peace? Joab, the one whom David himself is going to tell Solomon, you need to take care of him. Meaning, he needs to be put to death. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's not a lot of flattering things said about Joab in the Scriptures. He was a man of war. But notice that Joab tried to restrain David, but it, it just didn't happen. And so, we see down through verse 9, Joab travels throughout the nation of Israel, this phrase from Dan to Beersheba, and, and he numbers the people. This, pa this passage says 800,000 and 500,000 uh, in Israel and Judah, respectively. Uh, First Chronicles gives like a million and 470,000 or something like that. And, and the thought is, is that uh, at some point, uh, he stopped counting because this was so odious and did not include them in the, in the uh, uh, census reported uh, to David. But I want you to notice in verse 10 of this text, 2 Samuel 24, notice what happens. It says, But David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to him, the Lord came to the prophet of Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you, choose one of them, that I may do it to you. This passage is, I think, so significant here. And I want you to, to think about a few things. Isn't it the case that when we want to do wrong, and we've yet to do it, that it looks so enticing and so strong and, and it's just, for whatever rationalization we take, or the mental gymnastics we go through to get to that point, and we are going to have our way, and God will let us have our way, that if our heart is right, once we have finished, what is the first thing that happens? It's regret. It's instant regret. Because ultimately we realize that the sin was not worth the price. Now, I, I, I can't remember uh, every time I was disciplined by my parents. It might have been just once or twice. I don't know why I've uh, forgotten those two times. Uh, but I do know that, that some choices have been given to me for, as, as a consequence of my own behavior. Um, unfortunately, when I was a younger man, had some uh, interactions with the law and some choices laid out. But I tell you, the Lord says to David, choose one of these that I may do it to you. There's not a, there's not a, there's not a D on this. None of the above. One of these is going to happen. And, and as the writer goes on, it's three years of famine. It's three months of fleeing from men. Now David's already been through that, hasn't he? With Absalom. And, and then, three days of pestilence. Well, I mean, that's easy, right? I mean, what's three days versus three years? I'll take three minutes over three hours. 
But there's something that's, that's redeeming about what David says here. He says down in verse 13, or after they go through these, in verse 14, these, these options, verse 14, David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for His mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. I want you to keep your finger here in, Psalm, or in 2 Samuel and come over to the book of Psalms. And look at Psalms 103. Psalm 103. I want you to look at verse 8 of this text. Read down through verse 10. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will He keep His anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Have you ever noticed uh, how this works? When we see someone who's done wrong over here, whether in our personal lives or, or um, you know, crimes been committed, man, we, we, want, we want the judge to give them the full sentence and then 10% more, and then just, to, you know, at, just for good measure, just really sock it to them. But boy, when it comes to my sin, mercy, I just want to remind the Lord that He's merciful. You know, judge, you could show mercy on me, David here realizes what has happened. He says, I am in great distress. But notice, he sees the last option as falling into the hand of the Lord. This pestilence will be driven directly by the Lord. And he says, His mercy is great. Let me not fall into the hand of man. Well, in verses 15 through 17, we see the execution of, of this pestilence. We're told that 70,000 die. And then the angel of the Lord is coming to Jerusalem. His hand is stretched out against Jerusalem. I don't know how visible this was. We're told in 1 Chronicles 21 that David saw the angel of the Lord at the threshing floor of, of Ornan with, with his sword drawn. I mean, I from every picture that's given here in the Scriptures, this is a, a visible onslaught of the angel of the Lord executing Thousands and thousands. Just think of the numbers here. 70,000, if we use the numbers provided in, in, in Chronicles, is about 5% of the fighting age listed in that, in that chapter. Now, if you believe in this, uh, what is it, uh, three degrees of separation or five degrees of separation or whatever it is, but... The whole world is connected with just you know knowing five or six people. That's the whole. Would every Israelite known someone who was killed? Every Israelite probably knew someone who was killed. I mean, we think we think COVID was bad. COVID was nothing compared to the Spanish flu. Just a drop in the bucket. And yet, how many of us knew someone who was impacted? I tell you, David's sin affected more than David. I want you to think about this. I, at least I don't. I, I hope you're more calculated than I am. But when I'm going to sin, I just don't think of anything. 
And I think that's the problem. I'm only thinking of myself. And I don't think how it's going to affect my family and my neighbor and my reputation and the person who saw me act like, a, like an out-of-control lunatic and when I then try to present the gospel to them. And I no longer have the kind of uh, image and, and reputation that I want to have. I don't think about my sin. And that's the problem. It's all about me. And when you sin, it's all about you. This, this text tells us that the, the weight of sin and the cost of sin is far beyond what we calculate. David didn't wake up in the morning and think, boy, we're only going to lose 70,000 today. There's a beautiful insight into the Lord here in verse 16. It says the angel stretched out his hand towards Jerusalem to destroy it. The Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Have you ever uh, disciplined your, your child and weren't sure what kind of response you were getting from said child? Whether it was a, a hardened heart or a penitent heart. But after you saw those consequences laid in and the punishment for their misconduct, and we started to see the right kind of attitude come out of that and a, and a desire to do what's right, that you ultimately said, okay, I, I think there's been enough. There's been enough punishment. Well, I have. And I'm, I'm thankful that I've, I've seen that in my boys. But what happens when we fail to demonstrate that? Notice what David says here in verse 17. He says, Behold, I have sinned, and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand be against me and against my father's house. You know, um, it's almost a rule that when there's a, um, a collision due to a drunk driving accident, the intoxicated patient always survives. I, I have to be honest with you. I've been in the ER almost 13 years, and I don't think I've ever seen um, a seriously intoxicated person come out worse than those uh, that have been the victims of his or hers driving. It's true, people driving high on meth, and just, you name any form of intoxication. They come out unscathed. Notice what David says. Let your hand be against me. Every bone in his body wanted to retract and draw God's ire and God's anger upon himself when he saw what it did to the people of Israel. Well, God has a remedy for in, in 18 through the end of the chapter in verse 25. He sends him towards the threshing floor of Aruna. And this ultimately becomes the site where the temple is built. First Chronicles talks about this uh, being purchased by David for 600 talents of gold. Here there's a, there's a, a, a payment of uh, 50 shekels of silver, and I think this is, uh, represents a down payment that it, it, it essentially uh, was the agreement that allowed this, this area to be, to be held uh, because the temple would certainly take up more than the threshing floor. But in this text, Gad tells David to go to Aruna the Jebusite's property. And in verse 20 it says, Aruna looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming towards him, and Aruna went out 
And he shook his hands at David and said, Depart from me, you man of bloodshed. Now, is that how your Bible reads? That's not what Aruna said, is it? But that's what Shimei said to David when David was fleeing from Absalom. In 2 Samuel, I believe chapter 16, when David's on the run, Shimei is running along parallel to David, and he has rocks. And he's throwing them at David and at David's men. And he calls him a man of bloodshed. And he says, everything that's come on you is what you deserve because you're a man of bloodshed. And, and, And to the extent he says, you're just reigning in the seat of Saul. You you wrongfully murdered Saul. Now, one of David's men came up and said, just send me over there and I'll remove his head. And David, realizing his position, he said, let him curse because God has told him to do so. And there's this, again, this glimmer at the end where he says, perhaps... God will bless me in the end and restore me. This is is what David is taking hope in, is that that God will ultimately show mercy, and God will restore him, and God will relent from uh, the, the sending of this plague and this pestilence against the people. But I find it amazing that Aruna did not come out with this attitude towards towards David. I tell you, there was a time where uh, I had a brother confide uh, some sin that that he had committed in me and and was confessing that. And I think after I got over the shock of it, I I, I handled it properly. But at first, literally literally I, I was amazed that he was involved in this. And it, it floored me. But I tell you, it only took about two minutes <laughs> to realize, well, I think I've done worse than that. And, and here Aruna comes to him, bowing himself to the ground, asking why, David, are, are you here? And, and not, get off my property. Look what you've done. Have, have you come to see the angel? Right here on my threshing floor? First Chronicles 21 tells us that Aruna's sons saw the angel and hid themselves out of fear. You had some tornadoes that come through Indiana, and folks just say it sounds like a bomb going off when this tornado comes from. I'm, I think that pales in comparison to the presence of this angel. Dread, utter dread. But David says, I'm here to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be averted from the people. Now notice what Aruna says to David. Let my Lord the King, verse 22, take an offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Aruna gives to the king. Now, um, I have to uh, look up some Bible terms from time to time, and I believe the threshing sledge is what's used to uh, separate out the grain. It It was used to uh, I believe mow it, mow it down, and then draw it up so that it could be separated from the part that was that was cut, the chaff. And Aruna here is saying, there's going to be grain offerings, and there's going to be animal offerings, and you're going to need some wood, and the oxen here, the, the yoke on it, you can just use that. Essentially, everything that I have, I'm going to give to you. 
Now apply it this way. When was the last time you told a brother or a sister, whatever you need to overcome this sin, I will give it to you. Whatever you need, it's yours. Tell you, that's, that's a righteous spirit. What a tender spirit. You know, we need people like that. <laughs> We need more people like that in the kingdom. I need to be more like that. I need to be willing to give more to help someone through their sin. You know, uh, here recently, there was a, uh, a patient that came into the ER and... and uh, Younger than me, so that means he's really young, you know. Two years, I'm going to be 50. I'm like, 50 years old? What's happening? I remember my brother Jason told me he was 50. I was like, man, you're old. But, uh, you know, 10, 12 years younger than I, and had just lived a very hard life, had, had abused his body, uh, just rebellious, and... Uh, had at some point uh, gotten out of the addiction scene, but just really had, had train wrecked his body. And he came in, and I went through a workup with him, and I, based on his symptoms, I, I couldn't find out what was going on, and I said, look, we need some follow-up here, okay? Well, about three weeks later, he presents to, uh, to another hospital, and at this point in time, he had lost about half of his blood volume. Now, I, I, I know what bleeding is, folks. I wasn't that I missed it. It just was normal when he came. But I think his hemoglobin was like 13 or 14 when he came in. It was like 6 when he presented there. Had just a massive uh, GI bleed. And I had... I had talked to him before he left that day, and I said, uh, Matthew or David or, or whatever his name was now, is, I said, look, I said, would you like to get together sometime and, um, and talk, and, and maybe I could help you through some of these things that you're, you're going through. And because I had just asked, how, how did you end up in this state? And he just broke down. There in the, in, in the room, just kind of laid it all out. And it, it, was, a, a, it was very hard, you know, touched my heart. And so the plan was for us to get together. And anyway, just fast forwarding here, he uh, uh, went to this outside hospital. They found out that he had metastatic esophageal cancer. 36 years old. Stage four throat cancer. And later on, I had been trying to get a hold of him, and I couldn't get a hold of him. And finally, he tells me what they found. And I said, look, we need, we need to get together. <laughs> you know, we need to get together. So we set up a date. And... He called me the day before, and, he, and, and I was working night shifts, and I was going to get up that morning, and then we we're going to go out to breakfast and hopefully study a bit. And he said, man, I just feel terrible. And he said, I feel terrible. He said, I'm not trying to back out on you. I just feel terrible. And he said, can we put it off a couple of days? I said, sure. You know, no problem. And three days later, five days later or something, he comes into my ER Florid 
respiratory failure. And I said, I said, listen, I, I'm going to have to innovate you because you're, you're going to die. I mean, I've got to protect your airway and put you on the ventilator, and I'm running blood in him and drugs to keep his blood pressure up, and it's just full scale. And he <clears throat> says to me, don't let me die. I'm not ready to die. And I tell you, friends, very few people are ready when it's their time. And he never came back out. And I transferred him to another hospital, and he never came off the ventilator, never, never regained consciousness. And there are just too few opportunities where the call of God is so clear and so direct that we have the luxury of just ignoring it because another one will come along. We, we don't have that luxury. And, and David says to Aruna, in verse 24, No, I will buy it from you for a price. For I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. And that is the point. If we are going to come to God, it will be on His terms. He will take nothing less than everything. And it will require all that we have. If the price is this, He will not accept less than that. Because He is holy and righteous, and, it, and His character demands it. And if he has paid the ultimate sacrifice with the gift of his son, what more does he have to offer? How can I then look at it and say, nope, not today? Or could you ask something different of me, God? And I'll pay that. You know, I've... I've in studying this text, it just amazes me how arrogant, how utterly arrogant I am when, when I come before the sovereign of the universe and believe that I can dictate terms to him. It's the height of, it's the height of arrogance. It's the, it's the height of stupidity. And I tell you, if you're out here thinking you're going to name terms to God, or I've got another chance, and da-da-da, oh, you, you could roll the dice. You, you might have another day. You might. But one day you won't. That, that much I'll guarantee you. God help you and I to realize what was said so long ago. I set before you life and death. Therefore, choose life. Choose it. It's not up here in the heavens. It's not so far away that you can't do it. Choose life. And this is one of those deals where you'll gain everything and in comparison give up virtually nothing. Some Chinese junk. The accolades of some of your friends.
Isn't that a deal worth taking? I tell you, if you're subject to the gospel in any way, if you're not a Christian and and you've been thinking about it, and you hear some wild man up there telling you this could be your last, well, sometimes, sometimes a wild man is right. Or maybe you're a child of God and you are just vacillating in the world, out of the world, in the world, out of the world, into sin, out of sin. There has got to be a murder that takes place. And that is of your own self and your own desires and your own will. It has to be put to death. And I tell you, we need one another to hold us to that kind of standard. Because I tell you, I'm willing to put some of these things to death, but these other things, I like them to just ride along with me and stay with me. They're my, they're my pet sins. I tell you, we need to be that for one another. And, and there are those among you who are like that. Do not grow weary in being that kind of Christian. Do not grow weary in doing good. Man, because this is the best deal this side of eternity. If you're a sub, we ask you to come now.